Hello, I'm Ian Duncan and I'm speaking to you from Berkeley, California, uh, locked down uh, for the foreseeable future, as I'm sure you all are. And I'm very happy to be participating in the Dickens to go as part of the Dickens project out of UC Santa Cruz. We've been asked to choose a favourite passage uh, from Dickens and uh, read it to you and comment on it. It's a difficult, if not impossible, um, challenge to, to choose a favourite passage. I thought I would go, this is just something that particularly tickled me the last time I was teaching Bleak House which is the novel I'm going to be uh, reading from. It's not one of the famous, high-profile, more flamboyant or much commented upon passages in the novel, but it exerts a peculiar charm. And I guess charm is one of those qualities uh, about Dickens that's perhaps hardest to define, uh, to submit to analysis, but, it, but that is most peculiar to him, is most characteristic of Dickens. Uh, this is from chapter 20 in the novel about a third of the way through, and it concerns the uh, a secondary character uh, that the uh, uh, the lawyer's clerk, the attorney's clerk, Mr. Guppy, who plays a significant role throughout the novel, um, who's uh, whiling away the long vacation over a hot and humid summer in London uh, where there's nothing to do, there's no business in the uh, legal offices where he works. So he's bored, and I'll read the opening paragraph um, of the chapter. And then I'm going to skip ahead um, a few pages uh, to the wonderful scene of the uh, the dinner that Mr. Guppy enjoys. He treats his friends, uh, the, the uncanny, the fossil imp, as Dickens calls him, uh, Smallweed, um, young Smallweed, uh, a member of the... Uh, uh, the odious clan of small weeds, uh, these sinister characters who infest the centre of the novel, and then the, the drooping, faded, depressed figure of uh, Mr. Guppy's old friend uh, Jobling, who shows up a charity case and is is treated to the lunch. And the uh, uh, the meal is one of the, I think one of the the great festive scenes in Dickens. Um, it's more understated than perhaps some of the famous scenes of banqueting or feasting that we find throughout the novels, but it has a peculiar uh, vividness and charm uh, and humour uh, uh, that I want to get at. So I'm just going to begin by reading uh, the opening paragraph. The chapter is called A New Lodger. The long vacation saunters on towards term time, like an idle river very leisurely strolling down a flat country to the sea. Mr Guppy saunters along with it congenially. He has blunted the blade of his penknife and broken the point off by sticking that instrument into his desk in every direction. Not that he bears the desk any ill will, but he must do something, and it must be something of an unexciting nature, which will lay neither his physical nor his intellectual energies under too heavy contribution. He finds that nothing agrees with him so well as to make little gyrations on one leg of his stool and stab his desk and gape. Uh, wonderful uh, description of, of, of the exertions of boredom and confinement, something I think that we're all uh, confronting and, and dealing with now. This reminds me of the novel that, uh, that Dickens published about a dozen years earlier, The Old Curiosity Shop, and the uh, the wonderful figure of, of Dick Swiveller in that novel, who, uh, like Mr Guppy, but perhaps more reluctantly, finds himself employed as an attorney's clerk in the office of the odious Samson Brass and becoming fascinated by the uh, the, the monstrous spectacle of Samson's sister Sally who sits uh, in the office with him uh, and Dickens gives us this sort of hilarious description of Dick Swiveller um, fascinated by the figure of Sally and, and resorting to these sort of um, manic rituals in order to let off the steam of this uncanny fascination he figures with his character and as a way of like managing his own profound boredom about where he has ended up. And I'm just going to read that passage before I uh, move on with the, the old curiosity shop. And this is from chapter 33 uh, of the old curiosity shop. We're told that Mr. Swiveller can't help uh, breaking off from the work he's supposed to be doing, copying a manuscript, a legal manuscript, and staring in fascination at the uh, the bizarre figure of of Miss Brass uh, sitting across from him in the office. Uh, this happened so often that Mr Swiveller by degrees began to feel strange influences creeping over him. Horrible desires to annihilate this Sally Brass. Mysterious promptings to knock her headdress off and try how she looked without it. There was a very large ruler on the table, a large, black, shining ruler, 
Mr. Swiveller took it up and began to rub his nose with it. From rubbing his nose with the ruler to poising it in his hand and giving it an occasional flourish after the tomahawk manner, the transition was easy and natural. In some of these flourishes, it went close to Miss Sally's head. The ragged edges of the headdress fluttered with the wind it raised. Advance it but an inch, and that great brown knot was on the ground. Yet still the unconscious maiden worked away and never raised her eyes. Well, this was a great relief. It was a good thing to write doggedly and obstinately until he was desperate, and then snatch up the ruler and whirl it about the brown headdress with the consciousness that he could have it off if he liked. It was a good thing to draw it back and rub his nose very hard with it if he thought Miss Sally was going to look up and to recompense himself with more hardy flourishes when he found she was still absorbed. By these means, Mr. Swiveller calmed the agitation of his feelings until his applications to the ruler became less fierce and frequent and he could even write as many as half a dozen consecutive lines without having recourse to it, which was a great victory. A much more agitated and violent passage than, than Mr. Guppy's more mundane boredom uh, and, and very Dickensian, I think, in this sort of hilarious outbreak of, of barely repressed and sublimated violence uh, in the, this ritual that, that, that Dick Swiveller resorts to to kind of again manage uh, his boredom and this grotesque fascination he feels for, for Miss Sally Brass um, as if uh, Mr. Swiveller has become an avatar of the reader of Dickens marvelling at these grotesque creations in front of us. Uh, I'm going to move on. Um, Swiveller plays obviously a very different role in the old curiosity shop uh, than Mr. Guppy plays in Bleak House. Swiveller is one of the great, wonderful, fecund uh, creations of the, uh, the, the early novels of Dickens' great comic phase uh, and, and ends up playing a kind of generous, e even redemptive role in the plot of that novel, whereas Mr. Guppy, of course, is confined to um, uh, a more secondary and humble and ambiguous role in the novel. I want to move ahead. Uh, we're back in Bleak House now in chapter 20 to the uh, the dinner to which, uh, and we remember that dinner uh, is, is corresponds with what we call lunch in the uh, midday or early afternoon in Victorian London, where Mr. Guppy is treating first his friend Smallweed and then Mr. Jobling, who's fallen on hard times and hasn't eaten for a while, shows up. So I'm just going to read um, a short another short passage. So here's Mr. Jobling. His appetite is so vigorous that it suggests spare living for some little time back. He makes such a speedy end of his plate of veal and ham, bringing it to a close while his companions are yet midway in theirs, that Mr. Guppy proposes another. Thank you, Guppy, says Mr. Jobling. I really don't know, but what I will take another. Another being brought, he falls to with great good will. Mr. Guppy takes silent notice of him at intervals until he's halfway through his second plate and stops to take an enjoying pull at his pint pot of half and half, also renewed, and stretches out his legs and rubs his hands. Beholding him in which glow of contentment, Mr. Guppy says, You're a man again, Tony. Well, not quite yet, says Mr. Jobling. Say, just born. Will you take any other vegetables? Grass, that's asparagus. Peas, summer cabbage. Thank you, Guppy, says Mr. Jobling. I really don't know, but what I will take another summer cabbage. Order given, with a sarcastic addition from Mr. Smallweed of without slugs, Polly, and cabbage produced. I'm growing up, Guppy, says Mr. Jobling, plying his knife and fork with a relishing steadiness. Glad to hear it. In fact, I've just turned into my teens, says Mr. Jobling. He says no more until he has performed his task, which he achieves as Messrs. Guppy and Smallweed finish theirs, thus getting over the ground in excellent style and beating those two gentlemen easily by a veal and ham and a cabbage. Now, Small, says Mr. Guppy, what would you recommend about pastry? Marrow puddings, says Mr. Smallweed instantly. Aye, aye, cries Mr. Jobling with an arch look. You're there, are you? Thank you, Guppy. I don't know but what I will take a marrow pudding. Three marrow puddings being produced, Mr. Jobling adds in a pleasant humour that he is coming of age fast. To these succeed, by command of Mr. Smallweed, three Cheshires, and to those three small rums. This apex of the entertainment happily reached, Mr. Jobling puts up his legs on the carpeted seat, humming his own side of the box to himself, leans against the wall and says, I am grown up now, Guppy. I have arrived at maturity. What do you think now, says Mr. Guppy, about... You don't mind small weed? Not the least in the world. I have the pleasure of drinking his good health, sir, to you, 
says Mr. Smallweed. And, and they drink to one another. Um, wonderful scene. The, the, the joke here is that uh, Dickens is burlesquing uh, what's called recapitulation theory, um, popularised in the early 19th century life sciences. It's the doctrine that the, uh, the development of a fetus, embryonic development, recapitulates the history of a species. Uh, and Bleak House is a novel that's um, profoundly interested in pre-Darwinian thinking about uh, natural forms and their growth and their, their propensity to mutate. Uh, it's a novel that's full of uh, creatures uh, that, that, that seem to be semi-human or partly human or human beings who are speciating into new forms. It's, it's uh, part of the, um, the effect of what we think of as the grotesque aesthetic of Dickens, uh, tied, however, I think, to the way that Dickens has, has been reading um, early evolutionist science, um, the, the popularized by people like Robert Chambers in the 1840s. Um, so here, I, I think as elsewhere in Bleak House, we, we have what we might call a, a kind of serious um, agenda or scheme or system underlying what might seem to be even the most throwaway jokes. Uh, but what's really, I think what really catches uh, the reader here in this passage is uh, the generosity of Dickens's humor. Uh, Smallweed is um, elsewhere in the novel a rather contemptible figure. The small weeds are this sort of ghastly uh, uh, set of creatures. They, they occupy the far end of, of the spectrum of, um, uh, of the limits of what we might think of as being human uh, among the novel's cast of characters. Jobling is this sort of um, pathetic loser, but, but a figure I think that, that Dickens is able to regard with a certain kind of fondness and, and solicitude. And, and we see his type showing up in... Uh, uh, novels throughout Dickens's career. Uh, and even Guppy here gets to be master of the feast. Um, he gets to preside over this, this entertainment, which, um, humble though it is, an entertainment for the, the attorney's clerk and his friends, is, uh, is imbued uh, with a kind of freshness and charm. And I think as readers, we're invited to partake of it uh, without condescending uh, to the characters. The biographical note to uh, refer to here would, would, would be, no doubt, Dickens's own uh, first experiences of employment. Uh, he was um, 16 years old um, uh, and he worked for a year and a half, a couple of years, as a solicitor's clerk in London before he then went on to his more consequential employment as uh, learning shorthand and then working uh, as a journalist. But it's as if Dickens is able to look back to uh, the, the earliest phase of uh, his own setting out um, uh, to be economically independent, to working with a certain kind of fondness, yeah, even nostalgia, uh, and is able to uh, indulge and um, invite us all into the uh, charm and humour of these moments. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. If there's a takeaway, this is Dickens to go, after all, it, it would be to rediscover these novels for their, their freshness, their charm, their humour, whatever else may be going on in them. So I do encourage you to uh, uh, watch more of these videos. There are more portions of Dickens to go uh, that we can all relish much as uh, Mr. Jobling is, is relishing the lunch that's provided at Mr. Guppy's expense. <laughs>